Many of us have seen this headstone. It says, Remember, man, as you go by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so shall you be. Prepare yourself to follow me. And we chuckle at that, but we know that that is, uh, it brings us to the startling reality that things are going to change sooner or later for every human being. And Solomon puts it this way. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. How many of you like to go to funerals? (laughs) Not the happiest times going to funerals, but plainly said, the man that God granted wisdom, he said, if you had the choice to go to a party or a funeral, it's better to go to a funeral. Because, why? He says, because that is the end, or that's what happens in the end of all men. Knowing that we will die gives us much more perspective on how we live our life than thinking that life is one big party. And when we lay it to our heart, that reality, the reality of our impending death, it should change the way that we live our life. It really should. The last line of this proverb says, prepare yourself to follow me. What is the intent of that statement? Where do we follow? And does the Bible have anything to say about what goes on when we are laid in the grave? We'll we'll explore that briefly today, but first I want to get back to the perpetual lie. What does perpetual mean? It means it just keeps on going. It's never ending. It's something that's told over and over again. In reality, it doesn't even have to be told or spoken. It's just held as a tradition. It's just a granted that this is the way things are. And it's passed on from generation to generation. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. This is the first mention of death in the word of God. For us, death is a way of life, when in reality it is, it's the exact opposite of life. You know, we see things die every day and we don't think anything of it. You know, we become calloused and immune to it, Um, especially with just being hammered all the time in the news, everything going on, you know, it has less and less impact on us. But imagine how abstract or mystical death must have been to Adam and Eve, or even to the angels who had never even seen a plant die, much less uh, a human life or something that God had created. If you don't remember anything else about this sermon, I want you to remember this. The deception practiced on Eve was over two opposing views. God said, thou shalt surely die. Satan said, ye shall not surely die. Two opposing views. The issue is over whether you believe God or Satan, who was speaking through the serpent. You know, we, we understand when it says the serpent said, Satan was the one speaking through the serpent. For any verse you read in the Bible after this first mention of death, you need to ask yourself the question, does what I believe about death agree with what God said, or does it promote the perpetual lie of Satan that means ye shall not surely die? And the Lord God said, There's a little gap in there. You guys need to look this up for yourself. I'm just narrowing it down, okay? When there's ellipsis, something's left out. So you need to go find out what's left out. And unto Adam, he said, I'm just showing that God is the one doing the speaking here. In the sweat of thy face, thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. After Eve believes Satan instead of God, God speaks first to the serpent, then he speaks to the woman, and finally here we see him speaking to Adam. God gives his own definition of death. He tells Adam 
He is returned to return into the ground from which he formed and created him. This answers the question on the tombstone when it says, prepare yourself to follow me. We're following into the grave. We're following to the dust. That's the destiny of every descendant of Adam, unless God chooses to translate them or if they're alive when Jesus comes. That's the hope that we have. We're, we're a close generation. Jesus is coming soon. There is a hope that we would not have to see death. But we all follow Adam, otherwise, to the dust of the ground. But Satan has once again been effective in pulling off his perpetual lie, even in the minds of those who claim to believe the Bible and the very words spoken by God. Think about it. This is kind of like the, there's other things that are written in the Bible, and I, I understand that the Spirit of God was what inspired them. But we're talking about things said with the very voice of God here. And people don't believe that. It's kind of like they don't, they don't believe the Ten Commandments that we were talking about in Sabbath school. Even those, those were the words spoken by the very voice of God. So if you had to choose between what God himself said, or I would say the Son of God, too, or what a man has written about what God said, which would have the greater authority? What God has said himself, and we know, we know that to be true. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. So this verse confirms what God said way back in Genesis. If you are a descendant of Adam, your destiny is the same as his. Your death means returning to the dust just as he did. The wonderful news is that the second Adam, Jesus himself, won the victory over us, for us. And that victory was not over, just over the grave, but it was over sin. Both sin and the grave, Jesus has the victory. Adam's death is the guarantee that we will die and return to the dust. But Jesus' resurrection is the guarantee that by believing on the Son of God, we can be resurrected even after we've been turned to dust. And so that's, that's, that's amazing. However, we have to wait our turn. That's what Paul means by every man in his own order. You see that? I put that in yellow. Every man in his own order. We have to wait our turn. It's clear from this passage and many others that the change from dust to life occurs for the believer when? At the second coming. It's at the second coming of Jesus. Who needs to be made, who needs to be made alive? Only someone who's dead needs to be made alive. Only someone who's dead. If you're already living, there's absolutely no need for Christ to make you alive. That holds true if you're dead in trespasses and sins or dead in the grave. Jesus is the one that can make you alive in either situation. This waiting in the dust is confirmed by numerous portions of Scripture. I'm just going to go through these quickly. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. If a man die, shall he live again? This is Job speaking, and those others were Daniel. All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Then we go to the New Testament. For David is not ascended into the heavens. But he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. And even Jesus himself, after he had been in the grave, he said, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. For Daniel, Job, and David, there is a waiting period and specific point in time that the Bible confirms that their sleep and the dust will be ended. We've already confirmed from 1 Corinthians 15 that that point in time 
For that change is the second coming of Jesus. Daniel is not the only place where death is described as asleep. Even Jesus himself denied that he ascended to the Father after he had died and risen from the grave. His death was a sleep just like every other man who has died. Same for Jesus. Who would be the highest authority in the Bible to define what happens in the grave after you die? Jesus himself. The one who according to himself was dead but lives forevermore and the one who has the keys of hell and death according to Revelation 1.18. Jesus said, These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. The highest authority the Father sent to this earth, his own son, said Lazarus was sleeping. He wasn't sleeping holding a harp on a cloud in heaven. In fact, when Jesus came to the tomb, Lazarus had been dead four days already. You remember Martha said, he stinks, which means he had already started to decompose, which in plain language means he had already started returning to the dust. And just like the only people who need to be made alive are those who are actually dead, the only ones who need to be awakened are those who are sleeping. If Lazarus was conscious in heaven, he would have already been awake. It makes no sense. God in Genesis said that death was a return to the dust. The Son of God on earth said that death was a sleep or a state of unconsciousness, just like we saw in the book of Daniel. Any attempt to use other portions of scripture to, ne to negate what God and his son have said regarding death, the very highest authorities on truth, God and his son. If anything disputes what they said, that makes, out, makes God out to be a liar. And it confirms the perpetual lie of ye shall not surely die. Jesus said plainly that Lazarus was dead. And Jesus meant what he said. We can take it for face value. Death is the absence of life. Just like darkness is the absence of light. Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he, he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. There are several things that I want to, I want to uh, point out or observations I want to point out about these verses. First, they came just after Jesus had told his disciples that Lazarus was sleeping. Okay, this is in the same chapter, same context. Second, if Lazarus was already in heaven, this would have been a perfect time for Jesus to comfort Martha with that fact. But he didn't. If that were true, it would be the epitome of selfishness to want someone back who was already enjoying the bliss of heaven. That would be very selfish. If I'm in heaven, please don't call me back to this place. Okay? <laughs> don't do it. But of course you're not. I'm going to be in the dust if I die before Jesus comes. But Jesus' comfort hinged on the fact that her brother would rise again. Next, understand the theology of some of the very closest friends of Jesus. This is a place where Jesus spent his time. These are his friends, Lazarus, Martha, Mary. 
Martha knew that her brother also believed that Jesus was the Christ, the long-anticipated Messiah, the very Son of God. Lazarus believed that. Martha had the assurance her brother would rise again. But when did she believe that would be? In the resurrection, at the last day. That is because that is the timing of when all that sleep in the dust of the earth shall hear the voice of the Son of God to rise again. This is what they believed because this is the truth of Scripture and what Jesus taught them, as we shall see as we go on. This is what Jesus was teaching. That's why this is what she believed. She had no idea, or maybe she was hoping and wishing that Jesus would bring Lazarus back from the dead, but her hopes were in the future to the resurrection of the just. Jesus woke Lazarus out of his sleep, but he was not raised to immortality and incorruption, for that happens at his second coming. That is the appointed time. And Lazarus may have lived to a ripe old age, but he died again. He did. Another observation. The context of this passage, what is its timing? What's being talked about here? It's, it's, under, it's, under, it's underlined and it's in red. This is the context. So you have to remember the context of what Jesus and Martha are talking about. It's the resurrection of the last day. The last day refers to the second coming of Jesus. It's the last day of this earth as we know it. When when Jesus comes, the heavens are rolled together as a scroll. The elements melt with fervent heat. It is the last day as we know it on this earth. What two groups of believers does Jesus mention when he says, He that believeth in me. What two groups believe in him? According to this verse. There's two groups that believe in him. Right. Those, though, though he were dead, or dead believers, and whosoever liveth, or living believers. So at the resurrection, there's two classes of people. Just like Lazarus was in the grave, he was dead, but he believed in Jesus as the Son of God. He had the assurance that he would rise again. And if we believe in Jesus as the Son of God, that's our hope as living believers when Jesus comes. When Jesus comes, it is to rescue both those who sleep in the dust and the living. Whoever is living and believes in the Son at the last day or his second coming will never die. If you take this sentence, just that sentence, and separate it from its context, you're going to come away with a a wrong idea. Those who live and believe in me will never die. He's talking about it in the context of his resurrection. When Jesus comes, if you are living and you believe in him, you'll never see death. That's an amazing thing. We refer to this as translation without seeing death. There's some exceptions in the Bible, such as Enoch and Elijah, who were translated and the resurrection of Moses, and also the first fruits raised with Jesus at his own resurrection. But for the majority of people, they have to wait until the second coming of Jesus. That is their appointed time. Any other meaning you give to Jesus' words risks resting the scriptures and repeats Satan's perpetual lie of you shall not surely die. The other absurdity for those who believe Satan's lie is this. Why do you need to be resurrected if you're already in heaven? It doesn't make sense. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. This was true for Lazarus, and it was true for others that Jesus resurrected. They heard his voice. Who is it that hears the voice of the Son of God? Who is it? It's the dead. 
Okay, they're, they're the ones that are going to hear the voice of the Son of God. To, we're, Jesus is going to tell us to rise from the dead. We're going to be living if we're living. It's only the dead that hear the voice saying, come forth. The voice of the Son of God. When the dead hear the voice of the Son of God, they change from being dead to being very alive. By Satan's perpetual lie, people believe the dead are living without hearing the voice of the Son of God. Jesus said himself, this is how the dead are going to come back to life. They will hear the voice of the Son of God. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. This isn't Paul's thinking. This isn't Paul. This is the word of the Lord. This is something that's been given to believers. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. Here Paul tells believers to comfort one another with these words. This is our comfort. This is our hope. Not that our loved ones are in heaven. Not that the wicked are burning in hell. Our comfort comes that these people will hear the voice of the Son of God. Just like Jesus told Martha her brother would rise again, Paul tells us the dead in Christ, that is those who trust in Christ, those who have put their confidence in Jesus, will rise again. And, you know, this is one of the things that at a funeral it's very comforting to know that if someone loved Jesus, they're secure, they're safe. In fact, they, they don't have to deal with Satan's attacks anymore. Amen. They're sleeping. And God told Daniel to rest. It's a rest. And you've heard rest in peace. It is a peaceful rest because there's nothing, absolutely nothing going on as we shall see. Many people misunderstand this verse when it says the dead in Christ shall rise first. What does that mean? When it says the dead in Christ shall rise first. They will go up first. Nope. That's what most people believe. You don't think so? Nope. They're rising from the grave. In fact, if you look at the context, it says, um, we which are alive and remain shall not prevent, if you look in other versions, that means precede. In other words, when Jesus comes, the living aren't going to be caught up to heaven before the dead are raised. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. It's the very thing that Jesus was talking about when he said, your brother shall rise again. You're going to rise from the grave. And to confirm that, you can know, it says, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. So the dead raise first, then all the righteous, dead and living, are caught up together. We meet Jesus at the same time. Right. So there's no, there's no preferential treatment there. Anyway, if you don't hear the voice of the Son of God in the grave, you're not going to wake up another thousand years. Yep. And come up second. Yep. Yeah. That is true. I didn't have time. This, this is a very large subject. Uh, I didn't have time to delve into all of these things, but... but uh, yeah, those are some things that we could discuss. Um, the dead, but here again, remember Jesus said the dead would hear the voice of the Son of God. The dead do not live again until they hear the shout of the Lord Jesus himself, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God. It's going to be a very, no a very noisy time right there in that moment when Jesus comes to raise the dead. And they're going to hear his voice. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So here, Solomon is contrasting what the living know and what the dead know. What do the living know? They're gonna that they're going to die. 
You know, you don't have to be so old when you realize that you're going to die someday. And sometimes that even gives kids a, a fear that they have a fear of death, um, which isn't always a bad thing. We, we have to be careful because we are going to die. It's quite amazing that some of the living believe Satan's lie and do not know that they shall die. They think they're just going to keep going on living. It's e after they die. And it's even more amazing that when dead, they think that they will carry on loving and hating and actually really living. God through Solomon has communicated everything the dead know and experience. And what is that? Absolutely nothing. They're not experiencing anything. Death really is a sleep or a state of unconsciousness. And this brings us to an abomination that we find in the word of God. And see if you can make the link here. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. God in his wisdom warned his people not to tolerate any supposed communication with the dead. That's what a lot of these things are dealing with. Is dealing with communication with the dead. Familiar spirits, necromancy, a witch... Who was it that uh, told Saul that he could help, he could help her out? Or he went, he went to a witch to help him out when he didn't know what to do. The reason should be obvious. If the dead know not anything and you think you are communicating with them, the only option left is actual communication with evil spirits. These are fallen angels themselves. They are pulling a fast one on people. This is another way Satan promotes his perpetual lie of you shall not surely die. And we know, we all hear stories in the news of people that have these life after death experiences and they come back and write books and everything. This is not what God's word says. And God's word warns us that in the end of times, there would be wonders, great wonders. Satan's going to pull out all the stops to deceive people. And so Satan can perform these things, but we have to ask ourselves, ourselves, whenever we read those things or see those things, is this what God says or is this promoting Satan's lie? Our world is full of spiritualism or communication with the dead. This is an effective way for Satan to bring the world not only under his control, but under his delusions. Remember, we, we studied that uh, because they do not believe the love of the truth, God shall send them strong delusion. It's not, God's not the one with the delusion. He's allowing you to accept the delusion if you don't believe his word, just like he did with Eve. If, you, if you're not going to believe what he says, you shall surely die, and you believe Satan, you shall not surely die, you've accepted Satan's delusion. Because who was right? God was right. God was right. I go again, but again, the choice is between what God said and what Satan said. And if you bring that test to every, all of these other scriptures that we find in the Bible, if you bring that test to all of those, you will be able to find out the truth of whether something is right or wrong. So here's some misinterpreted Bible verses. I heard some people going over these in potluck last week. We're not going to go over them. Um, they take a lot of time and a lot of explanation, but they stump a lot of people. Rachel's departing soul. The witch of Endor brings up Samuel. The rich man and Lazarus all live to him. The thief on the cross and paradise absent from the body and present with the Lord, the spirits of just men, preaching to the spirits in prison, 
souls under the altar, and the dead standing before God. How do we know that these texts are misinterpreted? How do we know that these texts have been misinterpreted? Because God doesn't lie. God doesn't lie. No. Because they're all used to try to prove consciousness in death. They're all used in that way. To try to make Satan's theory plausible. That you do not really die. We already went over this verse, but I underlined again the two things that we need to remember when we're dealing with all of these things. In its extreme, extreme simplicity, it comes down to this. The two views are mutually exclusive, which means you cannot hold them both at the same time. You cannot believe both of these things at the same time. Either you die or you don't. Either God is right or Satan is. If Eve had believed what God said, it's very possible that no human being would have had to experience death. The evidence is overwhelming that God knew exactly what he was talking about in Eden. The evidence is that we all are headed in one direction unless Jesus intervenes. Jesus knew exactly what he was talking about when he called death asleep. And thankfully, the righteous dead will hear the voice of the Son of God when he returns to wake them from the dust. We are to comfort one another with these special truths. That is part of the good news of the gospel. This is good news. Amen. Blessed hope. It's the blessed hope. The wages of sin is death. All in Adam die. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord.